Thank you. And my name is Ron Rock. I am the founder and CEO of Microshare. We're a seven-year-old international company. We specialize in the infrastructure to get you the data. So how do you deploy millions of sensors at scale cost effectively to give you a very granular view of all of the data in our physical environment to begin driving the measurements and the goals to uh, ESG and sustainability? So we're gonna talk a little bit later about uh, how we do that and some of, the, some of the magic involved. Great, so thank you. I'm all about how do you get data? And there's a, a, a term that is gaining a lot of popularity and has different meanings in different camps called digital twinning. We're gonna digitally twin our, our homes, our cities, our bodies, our cars. And, and it, the simplest definition of digitally twinning is creating a virtual replica of our physical world. And why do we do that? We do that to drive the efficiencies that Pooj is talking about to drive the machine learning, the AI, the big data analytics. All of these allow us to drive huge cost savings, both financially and for all stakeholders, as we think about environmental impact of, of everything that we're doing. And with C19, what's happened in the last 10 weeks, this is being driven more and more as we look to reoccupy buildings and spaces, clean equals safe. And how do I know that a space is clean? And from a core perspective, occupancy drives virtually everything. It seems so simple. And what we've learned, whether we're talking to facilities management folks, CEOs, construction companies, ESG uh, uh, consultants, people using stuff is what drives carbon output, depreciation, assets being inefficiently used. And so if we can get very granular around occupancy and how assets are being used, we begin to get it control over all of these, uh, all, of the, all the business goals that we're looking for. So MicroShare, we have a, a data platform that allows us to ingest data from virtually any source, homogenize that data, put it in a standard format, wrap it with the right level of digital twinning and encryption and security and sovereignty to, to take, take care of all the governance concerns and then really you know, give the data to the data scientists to allow them to spend their time adding value, not reformatting and scrubbing and cleaning data. In the last two years, there's been an explosion in low power wide area network sensors. There's within LPWAN, there's something called LoRa. It's the fastest growing IoT network in the world. Tata flooded all of India, Vodafone's flooding all of Germany, British Telecom, the UK and the United States. Uh, Comcast and Charter Communications are, are looking to put this infrastructure in place. And there are now hundreds of sensors, many of them under $20 with five-year battery life that allows us to start censoring up virtually everything. So you see in the top left occupancy, but water leakage, air quality, waste management, smart parking, uh, temperature and humidity, CO2, and, and, and all of these sensors suddenly, if I don't need to run a wire, because it uses a battery, and it all talks to the cloud via SIM cards and backhaul, I don't need to get IT involved. Suddenly business people are putting all of these sensors in buildings at scale. One of our largest uh, clients in Dublin, the 1GQ building, it's the highest LEED certified building in Dublin. They had a bunch of sporadic sensors around, and they, sp they had three people dedicated monthly just capturing the data to do the reporting to maintain their lead status. Not a very friendly environment. Obviously, lead was looked at as an overhead. In the last year, we have totally revamped that building, put every imaginable sensor in there, and, and you don't have to worry about running reports. The data is coming real time all the time. And it's feeding dashboards, and it's feeding machine learning, and it's feeding uh, other applications. And so this idea of if we believe in, in, in the sustainability mission and we get it, there's a real hard, heavy lift on the backside of how do I get the data? And, and that's what we're doing. So within ESG, that has been a big driver for our business in the last few years. Uh, and now 
with COVID, it's, it's, it's really brought it even further. We've been doing indoor asset tracking for hospitals for quite some time, tracking hospital beds, wheelchairs, infusion machines, the amount of time that people waste looking for these kinds of things. And now all of a sudden, we've taken that same technology and we've uh, deployed it with contact management. And so companies want to know now at scale, if two employees are spending more than 10 minutes together, six feet apart or closer. And so we have wearables for the wrist or that you clip on your, your, your breast pocket. It's a Bluetooth LoRa type technology, very inexpensive. And we can now begin to track where people are in the building and when there's been contact events. So when somebody calls in sick, I can isolate part of the building and do a deep clean, not the whole building. I can isolate a subset of my employees and make sure they get tested, not shut the whole plant down. And that combined with all of the environmental, so we, we talk about occupancy being the tip of the spear for virtually everything that we do. Too hot, too cold, using too much energy, water leakage, all comes down to how many people are in the building, where are they, what are they using? So the environment is, is one big piece. From the social side, the contact tracing, predictive cleaning, all of those types of, uh, of data points that allow us to, to capture these problems before they explode into a crisis. Um, I was sharing with the team the other day, I'm working with a, a group in the UK, uh, they're developing commodes that do waste, real-time waste management. Uh, to, to analyze human waste real time and know, maybe before we ourselves even know we're sick, know that there's a virus now uh, in the building and let me capture that before I need to take all the drastic action weeks later. And then with the whole governance and feedback, uh, being able to put both keypads and, and a QR code smartphone, real time feedback, transparent feedback, how do we make sure any one of us can be in a building three months from now, if we see something that doesn't seem right, too many people in one place, something that hasn't been clean, some, something that's, that's uh, attracting too many people uh, physically touching things, get that real-time feedback so that we can adapt and drive it accordingly. So, so when you think about MicroShare, think about the infrastructure at a very scalable and granular level to capture lots of data to begin driving the ESG initiatives. That's, that's I, I'm always fascinated every time I hear you talk about the work that you're doing and how it's bringing um, just insights we once thought, it's like it's almost a sci-fi world is what you're doing, which is really cool. I have a question around, um, you know, data security and data privacy, especially when you're talking about like human waste and other things. Um, you know, how do you, how do you talk to the everyday consumer about that when, like an employer, when they're thinking about, well, you know, I have this data, this big data on my employees and people's kind of feeling about their every move being tracked? That's a, that's a great question. Um, let me start by saying it's very complex. It varies by country. It varies with unions or non-unions. It varies by industry, if you're highly regulated or not. And so there is no one size fits all. And prior to COVID-19, we spent, a, you know, even though we're a software company, we spent a lot of time on the whole human touch side of communicating, why are you doing it? You know, the, the show and tell in cafeterias, the signage, the whole idea of creating comfort that this technology is actually helping us to do things more efficiently, better for the planet, better for our own safety, so there's, there's a lot of selling involved as you, as you fight the hype, whether it be the cover of Time Magazine or you know, the Financial Times talking about how our data has been stolen, how there's you know, a teddy bear you know, spying on our kids. Like there's a lot of fear out there about the data and yet there's a lot of value. So, so since COVID-19, however, there's a lot of people drawing analogies to COVID-19 and 9-11. And, you know, 9-11, if you think about airport travel today, decades later, we're just used to the whole process of security. But the year after 9-11, it was a disaster and everything was a mess. And so the, you know, how we put um, the, the infrastructure in place 
if, if any of you recall, uh, those of you old enough to remember after 9-11, we were okay with the government listening to our cell phone calls. For a period of time, for a few years, the Bush administration was allowed to listen to our calls. And we were all down with that because we were scared, we wanted the security, we wanted to capture the bad guys. What's happened in the 10 weeks since COVID-19 became a real global disaster, people's privacy concerns have swung radically to the back burner. And so if, if I'm coming back to work and you're my employer and you're saying, hey, Sherry, I want you to wear this wristband when you're in work. No, I'm not gonna put something on your personal pro uh, smartphone. This is just when you're in the office. I want you to wear this. I'm not gonna track you personally. I'm, it's all anonymized unless somebody gets sick. And if somebody gets sick, I'll then, if you were in contact with that person, I'll let you know. All of a sudden, in this world, we're all willing to concede a lot of those privacy concerns in the WIF and what's in it for me? Oh, you're gonna keep me healthy. And so that seems to be the momentum right now. I expect that to change, just like after 9-11, a few years later, the whole government's too big, it's too bold. Um, and so we expect that to be the debate for the next couple of decades. From a software perspective, we recognize that we have to build in the knobs and dials. So at any point in time, I mean, right, even right now, today, I can do things in New Jersey very differently than California. California's privacy laws are much more buttoned down than they are anywhere else in the country. So that's going to be a, uh, a, a very ambiguous gray area for a long time to come. This is hard. This is complex stuff. The fact that we're all sitting on this call means that you know, we're, we're not normal, right? We're, <laughs> we're out there, right? We, this is complicated stuff. And most people have no clue. And so, you know, when, when we first started doing occupancy, we were, we, you know, we have these little sensors, they're, you know, 20 bucks, and they got a little lens on the side. It's, it's not a camera. People were terrified that we were videotaping you under your desk. Um, people would literally tear them out of the bathrooms and say, you know, like big brothers watching. And, and we ended up doing a, a whole series of uh, show and tells in the cafeteria and, and these WIFM posters all over. Why are we doing it? Why does it matter? And, and I love what Sherry said about like, give you control. We started just exposing more of the dashboard and said, here, you decide what to do with it. And you kind of nurture them along the way um, to get there. Another really uh, interesting thing tied to the conversation right before this and, and related, um, we did a lot of work with inner city um, communities in North America and, and minorities do not trust the data at all. And so when you look at things like wearables, even, you know, uh, uh, Fitbits and Apple Watches and, and, and phones with, with basic GPS turned on and you see minority communities shying away from that. And, and I was thinking as, as we're having these conversations in this session, I'm thinking how parts of society are accelerating more and more to understand the value and there are large swaths of people being left behind. And this is, this is more than the technology gap or the IoT gap. This is gonna be a life expectancy gap, a quality of life expectancy gap, as, mm -hmm. as the data tells us more about our, our environment and our human bodies and how we live and get the most out of life. There's a whole segment of people getting left behind and it all comes down to the same core issue that we're talking about over the last half hour. How do you, how do you, how do you unbias the data? How do you sell the data in a way that people are comfortable to participate? And, and that's, that's a big problem. So, so I, I'm working with some really cool companies in the UK right now, and this is, this is my favorite. Um, that, that pink, I can't tell if it's a polo shirt or not, but that pink shirt you're wearing and, and, and whatever belt and shoes you're having on, um, in the very near future are all going to be producing data. And, and you're not only are they going to produce data, here's a, here's a wild card. You're going to pay me. You're going to give me your data and you're going to pay me every month for that data. 
And the reason why is because one day you're just gonna, uh, you're gonna get a text from me and say, hey, Todd, you better go to the hospital because I'm tracking 100,000 men just like you, your height, your weight, your activity level, your, all these. And every time one of them has a heart attack, their data looks just like yours does today, the day before. And, and, and so the, it, what's in there? Global Data Mart is in there. Data monetization is in there. Data privacy is in there. Regulated by kind, all these things. And yet that's what I mean by extending the quality of life. They're, they're, How far they're, off is that? The, 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 the wearables right now are less than 36 months away. The business models and the regulatory, and again, going back to selling these concepts to, to people, I think, I think all that's very real in the next five years. I, and companies like Fitbit or Under Armour are going to be lead. Under Armour is building all the technology into their wearables right now. So whether it's your, your underwear in a very inconspicuous way or fashionable stuff otherwise, and it's not <clears> going to have, you know, big battery packs and it, it's suddenly just going to seamlessly fit in. But again, getting, getting back to the whole ESG thing, we're going to be able to directly begin correlating the quality of environments and the quality of how people uh, are being affected by their health. And suddenly the debate about global warming, if there is such a thing, starts to go away because you've just got the, hey, don't go to downtown Chicago. Just don't go there. Back in the mid 80s, an IBM personal computer was 64K. I used to sell them. It was $5,000. And only the, the, the top 2% had personal computers. Now we see you know, uh, Microsoft uh, and Google smart pads being given away to students in every economic spectrum. And so society catches up over time. The early adapters are fed by business models that work, economics that work. And, and I think this is an ongoing, I don't think there's a one and done answer here. I think this is the evolution of society. And at any point in time, in a snapshot, there's gonna be people that are ahead and people that are lagging. That doesn't mean that you stop innovation and you stop progress while the laggards catch up. I, I, I think eventually the society benefits from these things.